Good morning. I don't know about you, but this was quite an eventful week, uh, an interesting week on a world scale as we saw in Europe, uh, troops of Ukraine and Russia go to war and concerns and scariness about all that could transpire, what could still transpire. Um, I know my heart was pounding throughout a lot of the week, um, but I still say this as I say every Sunday, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have a lot of good things going on for us today, and we will rejoice. We have uh, Bibles being out, giving, being given out to youth this morning. We are welcoming new members into our fellowship. Uh, we are together, and so let us rejoice and celebrate in this time that we have together. I hope this time is uplifting to you and your spirit as we worship God and are in fellowship with one another. Uh, please sign in the red welcome folder so that you, we know that you're here, and uh, we can give you credit for that. And Kathy Cato, where, uh, there she is. I'm going to have her speak first because right after service we have a special event, and I'll let her speak about it. Um, we are going to be, after church, between the two services, out in the commons area, putting the welcome bags together that we are de delivering to Lydia House tomorrow. We have 30 of them to put together, and I thank everyone for all of the donations that you brought in for the bags, and I know the kids will enjoy these. They're for the kids that are new kids that come into the shelter that pretty much leave and don't have anything with them, and this will be just a... Um, a gift for them that they can have something of their own while they're down there. Um, also want to say thank you for the Valentine Day's cards. I know we've gotten a thank you from the Fontenelle home by Emmanuel, and I know the police precinct has also sent a thank you note. Um, very much appreciated. So thank you for that too. Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate it. A uh, couple announcements I want to make sure everyone is aware of. The Dr. Werner Jensen Scholarship application is now available for anyone who is looking to continue their education. Uh, the scholarship applications are out in the Commons area. Actually, I think they're this, on this side this time as you come into the door. And the Sarah Circle Easter Bake Sale uh, order forms are also available uh, so that if you need some cookies and sugar and bars for your Easter celebration, uh, that is available uh, for you to order now if you would like to do so. Um, in kind of a, sh a shift of look, I guess, uh, today, I know we're not really quite celebrating it, uh, but today in churches around the world, in, on the church calendar, today is Transfiguration Sunday. This is the last Sunday of ordinary time before Lent. Uh, today, this is the day where, <clears throat> excuse me, churches around the world remember when Jesus went up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he met with Moses and Elijah, and he transfigured, he became like light, glowing in glorious splendor, and the apostles were able to see his glory before he began his journey to Jerusalem, to his trial, and to his death. And so we, we, we celebrate that today. I know we're not quite doing that, but that's what today is. And I'm saying that all to say that Wednesday begins our Lenten journey. And if you'd like to join us uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening for our Ash Wednesday service, we're, we're beginning Lent. Lent is a special season of the church calendar in which all Christians gather and, and have reflective time. Pr uh, we, we pray, we sometimes fast. Uh, we begin and prepare ourselves to celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection at the end of Lent on Good Friday and Easter. So you are more than welcome to join, join me and the choir and others uh, on Wednesday evening as we begin our Lenten journey at 7 o'clock. Susie, do you have an announcement? Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. That's as Italian as I get. 
Just want to remind anybody who is not already signed up to sign up for the spaghetti dinner, which will be next Sunday. There are two seatings, 4.50 and 6.30. So don't miss the chance. The kids are ready to go, and we're ready to have everybody back and enjoy enjoying our spaghetti. Thanks. Are there any other announcements for the... Uh, Kathleen. So if you didn't quite capture that, uh, now that we're beginning March here this week, things are kind of becoming back alive, uh, spring-like, and especially with the weather that's supposed to be this week. Uh, so Women's Association begins their meetings again on Wednesday, and you do not have to bring your lunch because lunch will be provided. So on Thursday, is that, what did I say? Did I say Wednesday? I'm sorry, Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Thursday is Women's Association. Did you get that? Thursday, Thursday. Are there any other announcements? What day was it? Uh, Thursday, okay. Any other announcements? If there are no other announcements, would you please rise as you are able and however you are comfortable doing so, greet one another in the peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us begin our worship this morning with our responsive call to worship, printed in the bulletin or on the screen. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. The Lord reigns. God sits enthroned in heaven. Great and holy is the Lord. We praise God's great and awesome name. Let us join together in our opening song of praise. Sing praise to God who reigns above. five young people up here. 
I said, young? <laughs> Maddie, hold on. We're not going to do the children's message right yet. Okay. Okay. James Vincent, Grayson Cabrera, um, <laughs> Ariella Urban, Jeremiah Urban, and Maria Urban. These people... <laughs> Think like a kid this morning. Okay. These five young children finished two weeks of study on how to learn their Bible, how to use their Bible. So today they are going to receive their own Bible that they will use and read and learn about and everything. So before we did that, I have a question for the congregation. Will you help these children learn from the Bible answer questions, and help guide them on the right path? If so, answer, we will with God's help. We will with God's help. I have a question for you guys. Listen, will you use your Bible to learn more about God and Jesus? Say yes. yes. All right, good job. Okay, I just wanted to read a couple of Bible passages. Um, this is from John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. The next one comes from, Your Word is lamp for my feet and a light to my path. And then the third one, and this kind of goes out to the parents and the rest of the congregation as well. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? by living according to your word. So parents, grandparents, as we hand these Bibles out, it's your responsibility to keep them engaged in the Bible, to do the activities, some of the activities in the Bible, and just help the kids grow up so that they are a part of our church and know that they are loved by God and by all of us as well. So at this point in time, I'm going to call out your name. Can you guys all stand up? Stand up right here. And when I call your name, you can come and get your Bible. James Vincent, come on down. There you go. Grayson Cabrera. You can just get the whole group afterwards. Jeremiah Urban. He did very well reading the Bible, I'll tell you. Maria Urban and Aubriella Urban. There you go. So on the first couple of pages of your Bible is your name, the date, and who gave you the Bible so that you can remember this special date because it is very special. You've got a special book there. Okay, let's bow our heads in prayer. God, thank you for giving us your word, the Bible, so we can learn about you and your son, Jesus. You are a great God and adventurer. Be with us as we learn, study, and do what the Bible says is the right thing to do. In your name we pray these words. Amen. Amen. And you guys can sit down, and I'm going to invite the rest of the kids up. <clears throat> Wow, look at that. Very cool. Whoops, about stepped on you. Good morning to the rest of you. I miss Adeline. <laughs> so we are going to talk about this Bible today. Have you guys ever been on an adventure? What's an adventure? Um, like a hike. Like a hike, yeah. What else? Yeah. Yeah, Tanner. A thrilling exploration. A thrilling exploration. exploration. Yeah, very cool. An adventure is something that maybe you don't know quite what's going to happen when you start out. But it's going to be thrilling and all of that. I gave you the Adventure Bible. So you're going to go with these Bibles. You can go on many, many adventures, different adventures. You're going to learn so many things, and you never know where you'll end up. If you read a story, there's stories about mysteries and miracles and all sorts of stories in this book. 
So when you read those stories, you won't know where you end up. So I'm going to tell you, for those of you who didn't receive a Bible, I'm going to tell you some of the cool things that are in this Bible. They have a livet section. And sometimes they'll talk about different things in the Bible so that you can understand it more. Like they talk about the daily bread, which was the manna and quail that they received in the desert. There's a section called Did You Know? And it gives you more information about the story. And then there's cool activities in here too that you can do. So maybe when you get home, you can pick an activity and do one. Um, and there's called Life and Bibles Times, and it talks more about the story again. Like this one tells you more about donkeys. Did you know there were donkeys in the Bible? Sure, we, no? Do we have donkeys at the Christmas program? Yeah. Yeah, we do. And donkeys at Easter, too. So in your Bible, you have lots and lots of adventures that you can read about. And if you don't understand something, you can use the extra little things in here. And, and parents can help. And the rest of the congregation agreed to help as well. So I think you need to ask these people, some of these people, about the Bible. Yeah, cool, huh? Yeah. So, for those of you, so just shh, 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 shh. what, Jeremiah? Yeah, we got to keep that on there. Yeah, keep it on there. Good job. So let's pray, and then we can go downstairs because we're eating pancakes this morning. Woo! <laughs> Bible's not so much pancakes, they're for it. <laughs> okay, shh, let's pray, let's, okay, <laughs> let's pray. I can't pray until it's quiet. Remember, there's three things we do when we pray. Close our eyes, fold our hands, and bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for these dear children, their excitement, their innocence, the questions they have. Just be with each one of these, the ones that got their Bibles today. I hope that they open it often and learn more about you. And the ones who didn't get Bibles today, we got Bibles that they can borrow. But be with each one of them and their families and keep them invested and entrenched in your word. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's go get pancakes. Yeah! <laughs> oh, Jeremiah, take your book. Oh, the excitement of young children. <laughs> and pancakes. Especially with pancakes. I guess I can kind of feel what they're, what they're thinking. As excited children as they are, let us be excited children approaching God in prayer. Let us join together in our unison prayer. Holy, Holy God, God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond words and description. Yet, Yet we see your glory in the face of your Son. Prepare our hearts to receive your word today. May your spirit change us so that our lives reflect the glory of Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, choir. For our scripture reading this morning, we are finishing the first letter of the Apostle John. We're in chapter 5, starting in verse 13 and reading through verse 21. If you're following along in one of the Pew Bibles, it is on page 864. Hear now these words of John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I know that I am a few weeks late on this and that the Super Bowl was a two weeks ago, but I just can't help but remember and mention again how good that game was. It was so fun watching all the way until the end. I will admit, I'm not exactly an NFL fan. Uh, Since I've lived in Nebraska most of my life, I tend to watch more of the college game and of course the Huskers, so NFL kind of takes a back seat. Although, I will admit, I love the, the, the pomp and circumstance of the Super Bowl. There's just something about the magnificent game that it is that just attracts me. I can't imagine the thrill of being a player who plays in the Super Bowl. I also can't imagine the nervousness that the players feel right before kickoff as they're getting their gear on, sit in the locker room, knowing that they're going to play in front of thousands of live people with millions watching from home. The the players are going over their strategies in their heads, and they know that one lapse in play could potentially cost them the game. I don't know about you, but I would probably be a nervous wreck. And so that's why the pregame pep talk by the head coach is so important. The coach is responsible to to calm his players down and prepare them to play well in the game that is ahead of them. That's essentially what John is doing here in the last nine verses of his first letter. Up until chapter 5, verse 13, John has been going over the game plan for how to walk with God how to live as a Christian in our world. Well, the strategy time is over, and it's just about time to put on our helmets and go out and play. But first, Coach John wants to give us one last pep talk before we head out of that tunnel. He wants to instill confidence in us as we walk in our faith. And in our passage today, before he sends us out, John says two specific things that we can have confidence in. 
The first is confidence in our prayers. The second is confidence in our protection. John begins this final section by writing in verse 13. I write these things to you. I think all the things that came ahead of this verse. He he wrote all of these things, all of this letter, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Because we believe in Jesus as the Son of God and as the Christ wholeheartedly, John assures us, each of us, even us living today, that we possess eternal life. Now, this is not just the life that God has given us in this life, here and now, but life eternal. And it's not only a gift that we will one day possess, but something that we have now. The present tense of the Greek verb that we translate have, that he says that we have eternal life, implies the enduring and reassuring effects of knowing our eternal destiny. And because we know where we will one day be, we can have full confidence that we are safely in God's hands. Today, tomorrow, and always. One of the results of knowing that we have this secure hand around us is that we can approach God confidently in prayer. John writes in verses 14 and 15 that we can approach God because we're His. And then he says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Now this sounds pretty nice, but unfortunately, verses like this have led many Christians to the view that God will grant us anything that we desire. Like God is a magical genie that whatever we wish, whatever we would desire will instantly be given to us. But we tend to overlook what John wrote right at the beginning of this verse. If we ask anything, we like that part, if we ask anything according to his, that is God's will, according to God's will. We tend to forget that part. There are conditions to praying for what we want. That's probably why God has not answered my prayers for a million dollars somehow appearing in my bank accounts. Well, actually, God probably has answered my prayers. He has answered my prayers with a resounding no. (laughs) Whenever we pray... We usually add at the end of our prayer in Jesus' name. And I think this is an important part of our prayer requests. When we pray, we are to pray like Jesus. That's why we do the Lord's Prayer. Jesus gave us the example of how to pray, and so we pray like him. Jesus' prayers throughout the Gospels were always in line with the Father's. Jesus always did the Father's work. Jesus always spoke what the Father wanted him to say. Remember Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. Before being led off to his trial and death, Jesus in agony prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. But then he added, yet not my will but yours be done. The Father's will and the Son's will were always aligned. They wanted the same thing. What we want in life should also align with what Jesus wants, which in turn aligns with what the Father wants. And if we have this unity of mind and this unity of will, it is then that our prayers 
are truly answered by God. Now, some may object and say that, well, isn't that kind of a hijacking of our minds and desires by God? What about what we really want? Yet as Christians, we, we place ourselves into God's hands. We trust that God's goodness is better than our own. We trust that God's will is truly wisdom. That God truly does know what is best for us. And if we trust that God does know better for us, then perhaps our prayers could be more about listening than about speaking. When we pray, how often do we sit and listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit? Or do we tend to dominate the conversation? I know for me, in my prayers, I tend to do most of the talking. Maybe the next time we pray to God, maybe just sit. Don't talk. Just listen for a bit. Allow the Spirit the opportunity to speak. The Spirit, as John affirmed last week, is always right, is the truth will always guide us in what is right. And if we truly trust in the wisdom and the truth of God and the truth of the Spirit, then may we ask that what the Spirit desires for us, may it be done. Our confidence in prayer then leads John to a very serious example in verses 16 and 17. He says that we are to use our confidence in prayer to ultimately help our siblings in in faith who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, who are sinning. We are to intercede for them in our prayers. We are encouraged to pray for one another. Pray when we see another brother or sister going off and doing something that we know they should not be doing. We are to pray that as they, when they wander, that they may see the light and return to the ways of God. I think that's pretty straightforward and something that we often do already. However, I want to get into the intricacies of what John talks about. He talks about two types of sin to watch out for. He talks about the sin that does not lead to death and the sin that does. Similar to last week's water and blood phrasing, these two types of sin have caused a lot of confusion in Christian circles. What do they mean? What does, what does it mean about sin that can lead to death? Well, some Christians have read that as meaning that there are sins out there that if committed can never be forgiven. Think along the lines of the seven deadly sins. It's right in the name. The thought goes that if you commit these sins, God says, nope, and doesn't ever approach you. Denies you forgiveness and denies you eternal life. That's the thought anyway. However, I don't think scripture quite upholds such a view. Remember in John's own teaching within this letter, Specifically, all the way back in chapter 1, verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Notice John says, all unrighteousness, and it can be forgiven. So I don't think that John is saying that there are certain acts that any person can do that in true repentance can, cannot be forgiven because all can. So what does John mean by the sin that leads to death? Well, perhaps the best way to understand this phrase actually comes from the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church categorizes sin into two categories, venial and mortal sin. Venial sins are, are pardonable because they do not exclude the person who commits, it, who commits them from the kingdom of God. 
Venial sins are understood that they damage our relationship with God, but they do not ultimately break it. They do not sever it. They do not destroy it. An example of a venial sin would be hatred towards a neighbor or gossip or lying, something like that. It's harmful, but it doesn't necessarily break the relationship. Mortal sin is the complete turning away from doing what is right, doing, turning away from God and embracing something else entirely. An extreme example of this would be premeditated murder. You're, you're, you're actively disobeying the commands of God. And it is in this turning away from God that ultimately in, introduces eternal death. If one does not turn towards the life source that is God, well, death ensues. Another way to put it is that mortal sin is like a very critical injury that is ultimately lethal to one's spiritual life. It's pretty serious. Venial sins are like a a minor infection, like a, a scrape or a cut. Not too bad, they hurt, but they can be fixed and patched and repaired. However, if the minor infection is ignored, if it's not attended to and left to become infected and grow and grow and grow worse and worse, it can become a very serious problem. I think that's what John is trying to say here. He's urging us to pray for those types of sins that it's a little nick, but if left unattended, grow and become pussy and (laughs) yui, you know? Because after times, they can become very serious. We should, when we first notice something, desire to help and heal someone before it becomes too late, before it becomes too deadly. And all of this is because we have confidence in approaching God in prayer. And our confidence, John says, will help us as well as our fellow siblings in faith do what is right and holy and just. It's more talk about sin than I think you wanted, didn't you? (laughs) Well, John finishes his letter in a little bit more of an encouraging way. And he has three bold statements to finish his letter about Christian certainty. Verses 18, 19, and 20 each begin with the same sentence. We know. We know, and therefore we can have confidence, is the thought. And each verse repeats one last time themes that have been close to John's heart that he has expressed throughout this letter. Verse 18 addresses the ongoing righteousness of God's children. John isn't quite done with sinning yet, and he says that those who are born of God do not keep sinning, which we discussed a few weeks ago, doesn't mean that we never never mess up, but that God's children never intentionally disobey God's commands. We never openly rebel against God. We, We may do the Go back to the previous section, we may do the venial sins of the little things, but we never openly rebel and do things that God has made very clear lead to spiritual death. John adds that God sustains and protects us also from the evil one. We are under the spiritual protection of God and we have confidence of our salvation. Further, John states in verse 19 that we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. As children born of God, we are to have a changed perspective on the world. We ultimately do not look to the powers of the world for what is right because we know that they're not always doing what is right. And we know this because the world, John says, is in the hands of Satan. But John makes our hope very clear in verse 20. 
The question is, well, if the world is under, under the influence of the evil one, where then are we to turn? What hope is there left? Well, John's answer is that Jesus has come and, and has revealed everything that we need to know to overcome the forces of evil. In Christ, we know the truth. In Christ, we know what is right. John began his letter by reinforcing Christ as the focal point of our faith. And so here at the end, John does the same by ending with Christ. And I think John's final thought on Jesus is perhaps his most important, where he says, he is the true God and eternal life. Jesus is God himself and life itself. If we are with Christ and Christ is with us and, we can be, and that means we can be confident that we are in his divine protection both in this life and in the life to come. Rather than giving one last final greeting or even signing his name, John addresses one last thing in verse 21. He says, keep from idols. Now I'll admit, this is kind of an abrupt ending. Not one you usually see in any letter, let alone scripture. And many biblical scholars have wondered if this verse launched a whole new section and that after that was the true ending of the letter, which apparently maybe has been lost to us forever. I guess we'll never truly know. But I think this warning that John ends his letter on is, is somewhat connected to what John has said in verse 20 about the divine nature of Jesus. I think this could be John's one last reminder that Jesus is the one who we worship. Jesus is the one to who we turn to. Everything else will fade away. Everything else comes up empty in the end. Still, it's kind of a strange way to end a letter. But I guess that's what we have. So here we are. We finished 1 John. As we're about to begin our Lenten journey next week, I think the overarching themes of John's first letter are good reminders for us both here today and also as we go through our journey to the cross and resurrection of Christ our Lord. That we do not need to, we should not be misled to put our hope and security in anything in the world. That our hope, our security is ultimately found only in Jesus. And if our hopes and lives are truly placed in the hands of Jesus, then we can live confidently and know that we are doing what is right. That we can live in confidence that we truly have eternal life. And that we can live in confidence that we are truly children of God. And with that, we turn to God in prayer, confident that he will hear us and answer us. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have given us in Christ. A relationship with you, forgiveness of sin, victory over evil, wisdom for living in the world, love and mercy, eternal life, and the privilege of calling ourselves your beloved children. By your Spirit, help us live confidently as your children in the world, knowing that we can always come to you, approach you in prayer, knowing that you will wrap us in your arms and listen to us, and know that we are always safely protected. Oh God, our hearts are heavy this morning as we watch the news 
about what is happening in Ukraine. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for all those who are afraid. We pray that your everlasting arms may hold them in this time of great fear. We especially pray for those who are trying to seek safety and refuge. We pray specifically for Angela and her family. May you guide them and protect them. We also pray for the people of Russia. We pray for both their con- the countries and their leaders. We pray for those who have the power over life and death that they may choose for all people life and life in all its fullness. Even though it is, it's hard, we pray for those who choose war. We pray that they remember that you said your people turn swords into plowshares, that your people are to be people of peace. Jesus himself said, blessed are the peacemakers. We also pray for all the world leaders who are determining what they are to do and not to do. May they be inspired by the wisdom of Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. And we pray that the peace of your kingdom increase on earth until the earth is entirely filled with the knowledge of your love. We also pray all the prayers that are in our hearts and minds. We specifically pray for Barbara, who is having outpatient surgery this week. May it be successful and that the doctors and nurses take good care of her. We also pray the prayers that we cannot find words to express. But we know that the Holy Spirit knows and intercedes for us before you. We lift them to you now. We pray all of these things through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I hope, I think most of you already know that uh, the offering plate is in the back by the sound booth. And in response for God's blessings upon us and our return of those blessings to the work of his kingdom, would you please rise as you are able and let us join together in our doxology.
Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. O oh God, bless these gifts we present. May they represent just the beginning of our journey to show forth your glory to the world. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And at this time, I invite Margaret Schofield to come forward with me. It's my pleasure to invite those who wish to unite with us in this household of faith to come forward. Alan and Linda Chandler, Hallie Johnson, and Jerry Wilcox. Friends in Christ, we are excited because these people have found nurture and support in the family of Christ here at Northwest Hills Church. They stand here today to proclaim their covenantal relationship with Christ and the members of this congregation. They are here for service to Jesus Christ using the gifts which the Holy Spirit bestows. Hear the words of Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. Anyone who abides in me and I in them is the one who bears much fruit. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Allie, Linda, Alan, and Jerry, if you would turn to me for just a few seconds. We rejoice that God has brought you to this congregation and given you to the, the desire to unite with us. We ask that you affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ by answering the following questions. Do you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able. If so, answer, I promise with the help of God. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith and to be a faithful member of the church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world? If so, answer, I promise with the help of God. By your baptism, you were made one with us in the body of Christ, the church. And therefore, we give thanks for every community of faith that has been your spiritual home in the past. And today, we celebrate your presence in this household of faith. Allie, Linda, Alan, Jerry, one last question for you. Do you promise to, to, to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of Northwest Hills Church as it serves our community and the world? If so, answer, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Let us, the members of Northwest Hills Church, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. Please join me in what uh, is written in your bulletin. We welcome you with joy in the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love and be witnesses of our risen faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, and on behalf of Northwest Hills Church, United Church of Christ, we extend to you the hand of Christian love, welcome you into the company of this church. <laughs> Thank you.
Hold, hold on, just a second. Before you, before you sit down, I would just like to say a prayer over you that together with the whole body that we may be a witness of Christ to the world. So let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for calling us to be your servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for sending to us these believers that we may work together in serving you and others. Together may we live in the spirit, building one another up in love, sharing in the life and worship of the church, and serving the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now before you sit down, I do have some gifts to share with you. So I, first I have these very fancy certificates that if anybody ever questions if you're a member of this church, you can show them this piece of paper and say, I am a proud member of Northwest Hills Church, United Church of Christ. And on behalf of the congregation and also the sewing group that meets through the week, these are wonderful welcome cards that are written to you, welcoming all of you into the faith and family here at Northwest Hills. On behalf of Jesus Christ, welcome. You, you may be seated. And as the Church of Jesus Christ, we are the body of Christ, committing ourselves to service in Jesus' name. And so as you are able, let us join together and sing our, our hymn, and may it also be our prayer today, just as I am. Christ has received us all in his blood and in his name to be children of God. We come, we come to his everlasting arms 
and mercy and love and grace. And may you go forth from this place and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and your spirit today, tomorrow, and always. Go in peace. Amen.